to the book of Joshua, Joshua. And um, we've been looking at Joshua and trying to study your life as a Christian and, and the journey and the battles and the ups and downs and the trials and the tribulations and everything that you're going to have to face in this life as a Christian. And, um, you know, so many times, sometimes people portray the Christian life as though it's going to be easy. And um, it was never meant to be easy. <laughs> it, it, it's a life of battle. It's a life of complexity. It's a life of war. It's a life of disturbance. It's a life of struggle. It's a life of trial. It's a life of, you know, all different types of things that you're going to face in your life as a Christian. And what we've been looking at is most of you who've gone through discipleship too, you know and understand the seven stages of spiritual growth in your life as a Christian. And so in your life as a Christian, there are levels and developments of your spiritual development from the day you accepted Jesus Christ. The Lord wants to walk you through those stages and those developments in your life as a Christian. And we find in the nation of Israel that these individuals, they got held back. Um, that we've seen that it was the second generation that went into the, what was called the promised land. And the promised land is a picture of your spiritual development in your spiritual place where God has called you to be. And the sad thing is, is that very few Christians ever get to that point in their life. And they never overcome the obstacles, the battles, the struggles, the struggles, the trials. And they literally, if you look at the journey in the wilderness, if you were to look at it on a map, it, they ended up literally just kind of just bouncing around and going in circles in their Christian journey, the, the nation of Israel. And that's what happened with a lot of Christians. They never really accumulate or amount to anything for God. And their life as a Christian is just kind of wandering in the wilderness. And they never develop, they never grow. And most of you have seen people like that. They, they, they prayed the sinner's prayer. They bowed their heads and they received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. But you mean you look back and you say, whatever happened to them? And, and you realize that you don't see them in church. You don't see them coming around any longer. They're not part of the body. They're not part of the fellowship. They're not winning souls. And they're not really conquering and having victories in their life as a Christian. And it's because they got stuck in the wilderness. And Jesus calls it the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life. And they choke them and they become unfruitful. And so the, your life as a Christian is to progress and to move forward. And this is what this is a beautiful picture of in the book of Joshua. And this is what we're seeing. So we talked about in Joshua chapter 1 how God gives him the promises. And God acknowledges that he has God's presence. When he says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you ought to meditate on it. The, the day and night to do all that is according therein, day and night to do according to all that is written therein. So Joshua was given the commission based on the word of God. Your walk in your relationship with the Bible is the most essential thing in your life. If you're going to have progress in your life as a Christian, if you're going to develop and move forward in your life as a Christian, it's going to be based on the word of God. That's why we encourage people to study the word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God as a work that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Your relationship with God is based on your relationship with his word. Some people don't understand that. The word of God is how God speaks to me and how God speaks to you. So that's God speaking to us. And when we pray, that's us speaking to God. So the two have to kind of formulate and be intertwined with your relationship with God and the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. And so what we have to understand is Joshua was given the words and the law and the commandments of God, but that was his essential tool that was going to lead him into victory. It was the word of God that was going to bring him into success in his life as a man of God in leading the nation of Israel into the promised land. And so it was the word of God that God gave him to meditate on, to learn. It was the principles, the guidelines, the commandments that he had to obey in order for him to be victorious as a man or a woman of God. And so what you and I have to understand, if you're gonna have victory and you're going to conquer in your life as a Christian, you have to have a relationship with the Bible. You have to have a relationship with the Word of God. The Word of God has to be part of who you are. You have to meditate on it. When people? Day and night. And you have to observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and have good success. 
you're going to notice in a person's life when they get away from the word of God and they deviate from the truth of God, you're going to see that their success, their, their victory in their Christian life, their spiritual development will begin to decrease. And that's what happens in so many Christians' lives because they don't hold the word of God. David says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And so we have to understand that our victory is always going to be based on the word of God. Now remember, in the Old Testament, the battle is what? It's physical and it's literal. But in the New Testament, the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not what? They're not carnal, but they're mighty through God. So in the Old Testament, the battle was literal. The battle was physical. But in the New Testament, the battle is spiritual. But also, you have to understand, even though that Joshua was dealing with these physical battles, but he was dealing with a lot of emotional things in his own life, being the leader that God has called him to be and leading the people into the promised land. So even, the, even though it was physical, there was still a lot of spiritual trials that they had to face as a nation. Okay, And so what we see is we see different, three different positions here. I want you to look at, think about these three different positions. God called them out of where? Out of Egypt, okay? That's a picture of you and I being saved and being born again. You were called out of Egypt. You were called out of the world because in Egypt, they were not worshiping God. In Egypt, they didn't even know who God was. In Egypt, they weren't serving God or sacrificing to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. While they were in Egypt, they were in bonds and they were enslaved. And that's a picture of a lost man who is in bondage and who is in slavery. They might be in bondage to their religion, to their tradition, they're in bondage to the world, and they have a taskmaster over them who is, a, who is Satan himself, and what is he doing? He's giving rigor, driving these people, and making them literally slaves. A lost person is a slave to this world. A lost person who is without Jesus Christ, who hasn't been redeemed by the blood, is literally a slave to this world, and they're a servant of Satan. But God called you and I, he called us out of Egypt. And when did he call you out? It was when the blood was applied to the doorpost, the nation of Israel was set free. A beautiful picture of our salvation. So stage one is God calling you literally out of the land of Egypt. He called you out of the world. And that from that point on, the Bible says that you became a child of God, that you became a son of God. Okay? Literally, you and I were born into the family of God, and Israel was born as a nation as they were set free from Egypt. Now, I want you to think about this because this is very important. From the time they got called out of the land of Egypt, now they have a journey to go. Your life, from the time you got saved, it began a new journey for you. It began a journey that God wants to lead, guide, direct, protect you, and bring you to a place that is the promised land. God wants to move you out of Egypt. He wants to bring you into that point of that promised land. And what we have to realize is that you and I are pilgrims and what? Strangers in this world. Guys, the nation of Israel, they were pilgrims, they were wandering, and they were strangers. Your life as a Christian, it's a journey. And this is what happens is so many times we, you know, we get to the Jordan River. We don't cross it. We see the Red Sea. We get faint. And all of a sudden we see the nation of Israel on this journey. And that journey is a picture of you. It's a picture of me as a Christian progressing and moving forward for God. God doesn't want any of us to wander in the wilderness for several years. And that is the major thing that happens in the monks of Christians is they get kind of just caught up. They begin to murmur. They begin to complain. They begin to doubt. They begin to lack faith in God. And they end up wandering in the wilderness. And they never grow and to develop into the point where God wants them to be. I was dealing with a, a, an individual the other day, and he had gotten saved when he was seven years old. And, and as we began to talk, and I talked with him about the Bible and, and tried to get him to understand certain things, he knew nothing of the Word of God. And this is a guy who got saved, clear-headed, level-headed, who got saved at the age of seven years old, who knew nothing of the Word of God, who knew nothing of the will of God in his own personal life. So that tells me that this individual, whoops, this individual, oh dear, that individual was literally wandering in his life, and now he's 30, 34, 35 years old, and he had been wandering in his life all of those years and got saved at seven years old. God only knows what God wanted to do in his life. God only, well, it wasn't Brother Freddie. No, it wasn't me. That, that is me. <laughs> yeah, and that's a sad thing because now you have people that get saved and they just wander. 
They don't know the will of God. They haven't studied the word of God. They don't know the direction of God. And in their life, they have lost every battle. They haven't overcome. They haven't conquered the Jerichos. They haven't conquered the different places, the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Hittites. And they haven't made victorious stances in their life as a Christian. And that's a sad place to be because you'll find that, in, in, especially in this church age, the day and age that we live in now, is that Christianity has been broken down, it has been watered down, and these Christians never develop into the place where God wants them to be. And we see this so many times where Christians, are, whether, they're, whether they're battling with their emotions, whether they're battling with sin, whether they're battling with fear and doubt and apprehension, whatever it is, but the, the things of the world are just pulling them down and keeping them from developing and keeping them from growing and keeping them from conquering. The Bible says that we are more than what? Conquerors, conquerors through him that what? Through him that loved us. We are more than conquerors. Listen, right? We are to be, a, we're to be a victorious people. You have the God, right? The God who spoke the universe into existence fighting for your victory in your life. Amen. That is what this book is a picture of. Joshua has to face battle after battle after battle, but you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't worry about it because the, the battle is who? The it's the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. Guys, you've got to understand that, right? God wants to lead you into victory. God wants to guide and direct and protect you. The hand of God wants to encourage you, lift you up, and God wants you and I to have victory in our life as a Christian, we sing that song, Victory in Jesus, you know, and that's what God wants. God wants you to be victorious in your life on a daily basis, every day of your life. And we have Christians that are living a defeated Christian life. They can't read their Bible. They can't focus. They can't meditate. They can't memorize the word of God. But they cannot win souls. Forget that. They cannot impact people's lives. They can't witness. They can't be an effective soldier for the Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, listen. And no man that boreth entangleth himself with what? Yes. The affairs of this life that he may please him who has called him to be a good soldier. Listen, Joshua had to follow the guidelines and the principles that God gave him. Why? So God could lead him into victory and he could have victory after victory in his life as a Christian. And that is what the whole Christian life is about. We know Ephesians. And if you were to think about a book that would go alongside Joshua, it would be the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. We have Ephesians chapter six. You know, you guys all know the Christian in complete armor over there. You know, and so we don't wrestle against flesh and blood and the weapons of our warfare in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And so we understand this in a literal sense, but how do we understand it in a spiritual sense? Where are you right now in the journey that God has for you? Where are you right now? Can you stand up and say, Pastor Mike, I am here. I am here. I'm stage one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Where are you in your Christian development? Where are you in your journey? Listen, guys, right now the world and with the things we're facing are going to become more difficult. We don't know what's going to happen in November with the election, but the Christian life is becoming much more complex. Okay, so our journey as a Christian is going to be more, more, um, more, more dramatic, so to say, as a Christian, because we don't know what's going to happen in the United States, right? We do know what's going to happen, we just don't know when, okay? We, it's not so much what's going to happen, it's more of when is it going to happen. Now, we're praying that God is going to give us more time in the United States as our country, but who knows what's going to happen? Who knows the outcome, okay? None of us know the outcome. No man knoweth the day and the hour. But, it's, but at the same point, you as a Christian have to realize that you are a pilgrim, okay, in this world, and you're a stranger. Amen. That's one of the biggest dilemmas I really believe that people struggle with. Listen, guys. God did not want his people to remain in the wilderness. So you know what they had to do to worship God? They had to set up what was called the tabernacle. For those of you who don't know what it is, the tabernacle was nothing more than a tent. Does everyone understand that? Mm -hmm. It was a tent. You know what a tent represents? That you're just what? Camping out, folks, that this is not your what? Oh, Permanent home. You know what the Bible calls your body in the book of uh, in the book of Corinthians? Paul says, after I have put off this tabernacle, this tent. You have to realize this world is not your home. So for some reason, Christians like we, we think like, oh man, I'm gonna I'm gonna get my roots in so deep 
Listen, they were called out of Egypt and to go into the promised land where they would erect a permanent temple. The permanent temple was their dwelling place. It was the place of victory. It was the place of conquest. It was the place where the power of God was upon them. And Israel was going to be a light to all of the world. That's where God wants you to be. Amen. Guys, understand this. This is one of the hardest things for us as Christians. Is we think that this world is our home. <laughs> it's not. It's not. So you know what God does every once in a while? He comes down and he shakes up the world. And he'll shake up your life individually and personally. And he'll say, tell you, this isn't your dwelling place. This is not your dwelling place. The apostle Paul says, we don't look at the things that are seen for the things that are seen are what? Temporal. They're just temporal. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, set your affection on things above, not on the things of the what? Earth. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is just the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And the world thereof, what? Passes away. It passes away. You see, your life is a journey that is leading you to the third heaven, to the kingdom of God. Guys, that's one of the biggest things in the Christian life that we have to come to terms with. So many of us find ourselves enjoying the, the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life and we become what? Unfruitful. We become unfruitful. Think about that. When Jesus says that, he's giving you the parable of the sower. You guys know the story. And, and one gets caught in the thorns and he says the thorns what they represent the cares the riches and the pleasures of this life and they choke them and they become what unfruitful they don't amount to anything for God they can't produce fruit the fruit of the Holy Spirit the fruit of uh, the, the works of God in their life they can't produce fruit in winning souls and bringing people to an understanding of who Christ is Jesus told the disciples you have not chosen me. I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth what? Much fruit. <coughs> Where's the fruit? Where's the fruit? The fruit is a, it's, it's a progress in your life. It's a journey that you take. It's a journey. This whole concept of the Christian life, it is a journey. Now, if you were to open to Joshua chapter 5, right? Joshua chapter 5. And look what happens here, right? Joshua chapter 5, verse 1, And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the, on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we, until we were passed over that their heart melted. Look at this, right? Neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. Now they heard what God did. They know that there was a great multitude of people that came out of Egypt. And now what happens? These people are afraid because they know that they're going forth. And what are they doing? They are conquering. Now what are they doing? They're conquering in the name of God Abraham, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's who they're conquering in. So the mindset of these people is that the nation of Israel has a superior God over them. Does everyone understand that? That's why they were afraid. Because back then, everything was about imagery and idolatry and gods and deities. Now they're looking at the nation of Israel and they're saying, what kind of God do they possess? What kind of God is supporting them? What kind of God is leading them out here? And what kind of God has literally us, give them the ability to cross that Red Sea, the Jordan River? And so the nation of Israel and the people around them, they're observing the power of God in their life. I want you to understand something. In your life as a Christian, right? When people look at you and people begin to observe your life, can they see what God has done in your life? Can they literally look at you and be like, wow, God has taken you from point A and he's brought you to point B? Or is your life still the same? 
See, their lives represent, that's the testimony right there in, in verse 1. You're seeing the testimony of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they were literally, the nation of Israel, were experiencing the power of God. Why? Because of the ground they were conquering and because of the progression and where they came from. Your family members should be able to look at your life and go, wow, look where they've come from. They were once over here in Egypt. Now they're moving forward as a Christian. They're developing and they're still not in the land of what? Egypt or in the wilderness. Some of us wonder why we can't witness to our families. You ever think about that sometimes? Sometimes you think about why your words don't have the power in, in them to witness to them and to expound the word of God to them because maybe because you've still been wandering in the wilderness and they haven't seen victories and the power of God in your life. See, we have to think about these things. We have to really begin to observe these things. You know, you might still have that same bad spirit and that bad attitude when you come over to the house. You might still have that same negative, critical, condescending way about you where God has to transform those things where people can look and say, if any man be in Christ, he's a what? He's a new creature and old things have passed away and behold, all things become what? New. When they see that power of God. Now look what happens here, right? If you don't know the rest of the story, but from this point on, Joshua has to circumcise these people. Okay, if you look at verse 2 at that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Now what happened is, is the people, that next generation that was in the wilderness, they were never circumcised. Okay, so not only were they not circumcised, but remember, these young people from the nation of Israel, they were being led astray. And by the grace of God, God still brought them into the promised land. So they had to go back and do what? Do what God has called them to do. That circumcision is a picture of your salvation. Most of us understand this. I'm not going to go through it. But the Bible talks in the book of Colossians that you and I were circumcised. Not with the circumcision of what? Hands. Okay? But it was a circumcision which was of who? Of God. And that circumcision, it's a picture and it's a representation of our salvation. Now think about this, guys. While they were in Egypt, right, there was issues going on. While they were in the wilderness, there was no circumcision taking place. So Joshua has to come back and circumcise the children of Israel before they could go into what? Battle and conquer. They had to be obedient to what God has called them to do. If you remember the story with Moses and his wife and God had called Moses into the, to go deliver the people of Israel. And God told Moses, he says, you've got to circumcise your child or I'm going to kill him. And Moses' wife got all mad and she took the knife and circumcised the son. And how many of you guys know the story? You guys know the story. And, and what was God? Why? Why was God? Wait a second. God just called him to do something. But now he has to go back and circumcise the son or God's going to kill him. Well, what was the purpose behind that? Because God has required certain things of you and me. And what is that requirement? It's obedience, guys. It's obedience. Think about this, right? In the book of Joshua chapter 1, let's turn back there really quick. Joshua chapter 1. I want you to see this because this is very important that we look at this, right? Joshua chapter 1. Now look down there around verse um, 6, right? God tells them, be strong and of good courage. All right, for unto this people shalt thou divide an inheritance and the land which I swear unto thy fathers to give them. He says, you be strong, you be of good courage, and you're going to do, you're going to do it. Okay, be strong. Okay, the Christian life is not a life of weakness. Okay, it's a life of strength. It's a life of fortitude. It's a life of power. That's what it is. And our strength and our fortitude and our power comes from God. We understand that. But yet we find a lot of Christians that are just weak mentally, weak emotionally, and they're weak spiritually, and they begin to cry and collapse where they're not progressing and moving forward. You see some of these guys, and they go to the gym, and they, man, they're big and they're strong, right? but yet mentally or emotionally, they can be weak. And by all means, spiritually as well. See, the Christian life, it, it's, it's a place where you have to be strong. What do you think it says in the book of Ephesians? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of what? His might. Guys, this isn't no place for wimps. This isn't a place for people that are going to be overly sensitive. 
Oh, so-and-so didn't say hi to me. Big deal. So-and-so didn't say hi to me for a year. You know, it's like, come on. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto thy fathers to give them. God wants to bless them, just like he wants to bless you, and he wants to want you to move you. Now look at this, only be only be thou look at this, only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to the what? To the law. Now pay attention, right? Joshua's obedience to the law was his what? It was his strength. Do you understand that? It was his obedience that God had called him to obey the word of God. And if he obeyed the word of God, that was going to be his strength. Does everyone understand that? Yeah. Let me break it down to you like this, right? The, law, the Bible says that God's laws and his commandments are not grievous to us in 1 John. Right? But they're what? They're a blessing to us. Did you know that if you live by the principles and the laws and the commandments of God, you're going to be better off? Did you know yeah. that? Did you know that if you take the Old Testament dietary laws and you eat according to those dietary laws, that you're going to be a lot more healthy? Did you know that? How many guys do that? Okay. Most of us, listen, we just take God's laws and say, well, I'm not under the law anymore, so I'm going to eat this and do this and do this. Let me tell you something. Yes, we're not under the law. We're under grace. But there are certain principles that God has given to us in his laws that you will benefit by keeping them. Now, here we are dealing with this issue of circumcision. Joshua has to go back. Now, think about the mentality of these men. You're not talking babies. Does everyone understand that? Joshua says, okay, guys, line up. Me and all the Levitical tribe are going to circumcise you. They're like, what? I mean, I'm 30 years old. You're going to circumcise me? Now, guys, think about the mentality, okay? Now, sometimes obeying God's law, it, it, it may not even seem logical. And by all means, it doesn't seem easy, right? But they knew they had to abide by God's law and do what God called them to do if they were going to be what? Victorious people. You know what happens? We break God's laws over and over and over. And then we think we're going to be victorious. It doesn't work that way. It's just not going to work that way. They had to do this. They had to do it. They understood what it meant. They understood what it was a picture of. They understood that God was giving them circumcision to separate them from all of the other nations. You want to talk about prejudice and racism. Man, God says, listen, my people are going to be a different people. They're going to be a called out people. They're going to be a circumcised people. Tells him, only be thou strong and very courageous. Now watch this. Let's keep going on. Because I want you to see this one more time. Um, uh, uh, to do according to the law, verse 7, which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Look at it. It says, now we're dealing with the law of God. It says, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest what? Prosper. Prosper with us, so thou goest. So in order for them to prosper, they couldn't deviate from the law. They couldn't turn to the right they couldn't turn to the left. The law had to be in front of them and they had to maintain in keeping the commandments of God. Now remember, they received the law in the book of Deuteronomy, okay? They received the law in the book of Exodus, the later chapters, God gave them the law and the law was a list of series of events and things that they had to do. So they're keeping the law, it was maintaining them as a nation and as a people. Listen, guys, without law, there is no balance. Without law, there is no principle. Without law, these crazy uh, Democrats talking about to take away with the police. Do you ever think about how absurd that is? And you know what they want to do? They want to break down the laws that in our country. Listen, if there is no law and we have, uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence, right? We think about that. What is the principle of that? Those principles are biblically based in their laws and commandments that our country has to abide by in order for us to what? Prosper, people. If those laws and commandments are removed, what, this, what, these, what these Democrats are trying to do, they want to break down the laws and the principles of the family, the home, and everything in society. Why? Because now there's no structure and there's no order, and by all means, there will be no prosperity as a nation. Pastor, there you go. Pastor Mike, bringing up that political stuff again. <laughs> Guys, this applies to the Word of God. 
And if you can't see it, you're crazy. The nations that forget God shall be what, people? They shall be turned into hell. The nations that forget God shall be turned into hell. You look around the world. All of these nations that have forgotten God, China, Africa, you think all around here. Why does everyone want to come to America? Because we had established laws and principles that give us guidelines and protection and they give us stability and they give us strength as a nation. Joshua had to abide by the principles and the laws and the commandments of God in order to receive the blessings, in order to receive the prosperity, in order to have the victory in their life. That's where victory comes from. It comes from the, the keeping the commandments of God, the laws, the principles. Why? Because the way God designed this universe is that if we abide by his laws and his principles, we will be blessed. Did you know in nature has all been cursed, but there's only one being that breaks the laws of God continuously? Did you know that? No. It's humans. We're the ones that break the laws of God. Guys, if you, I don't have time to get into it, but when you get a chance, read Romans chapter 8. It talks about the creature itself was not subject. It was the creature that was brought into the curse of this world. The animals still obey the laws of God by nature. Listen, man disobeys God and his laws by nature. And when we disobey God by nature, what happens? There are consequences. Because the way God created humanity and the race of this world is that the laws have to fit together. And when we don't abide by the laws and the laws are broken, what does it bring? It brings death and curses and punishment and all these different things. It's the nature of the way it is. You think about AIDS, for example. Everyone knows that AIDS came from what? I mean, homosexuality. And it's, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a disease that is being passed on. Why? Because man has broken God's what? Laws. You want to know why the world is in a mess that it's in right now? Because we have broken God's laws. You want to know why the country is in a mess it is right now? Because these people have broken God's what? Laws. With abortion, with um, pedophilia, and all these different things. They continue to break the laws of God. And what happens is, is the, the land becomes a curse. It talks about shedding innocent blood and that the land will be defiled. Guys, the laws of God. Listen, we can't even grow really good, healthy food anymore. Why? Because we've broken the laws of God. We took the land, we worked it, worked it, worked it, worked it. Now the land, we sucked the nutrients out of it. Now you got to pump it with fertilizer. you got to pump it with all this stuff. And then what happens? All these chemicals, they get into your body, and then cancer goes through the roof. If we were to take the land and let it rest a year, every, every, on the seventh year, let it rest, it would reproduce itself. Guys, everything around us is built on the principles and the laws of God. Everything around us. Everything. Notice what it says in verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Joshua, you've got to talk about it. You've got to speak about it. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. See that? So now Joshua is dealing with this issue of circumcision once again. And they've got to take thousands of men and circumcise them before they could go forward. See, what God was doing is God was showing Joshua the essential of keeping the law of God. He wanted Joshua to understand, Joshua, this is part of my law. This is part of my commandment. This is what I've called my people to do, to be a separate people from all of the lands, to be a separate people from all of the nations, to be a separate people and to be a holy people. Ye are a holy, royal priesthood unto me. God had to give them that circumcision to separate them, and they had to obey. If Joshua didn't obey that call and that commission, they were not going to go forward. If Joshua didn't obey the word of God in this area of circumcision, they were not going to progress. Guys, obedience to the word of God is what gives us progress as a people, as God's children. The book of the law can't depart out of your mouth. 
but you're to meditate on it when day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Notice what it says. For then thou shalt make thy way what prosperous. Notice there's a thou. Who's the thou meaning to? He's not saying that I will make your way prosperous. God says then what? Thou shalt make thy way prosperous. You hold the destination of prosperity in your hands. And guys, we're not talking about being rich. We're talking about spiritual prosperity. Okay? So don't leave here and say, well, if I obey God, I'm going to hit the mega box. Listen, you hit the mega box, it'll probably kill you. You don't need to hit the mega box. Some of you have that kind of money. God only knows what would happen to you. So we're dealing with spiritual prosperity. Okay? We're dealing with spiritual development. We're dealing with spiritual fruit. And then look what it says. Then thou, you, will make your way prosperous. And then thou, you, shall have good success. So if you obey God's word, who's making your way prosperous? You are. Through what? Through obedience. Through obedience. Jesus says, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Obedience is the issue. Simple things. Come to church. Read your Bible. Study your Bible. Learn to, learn, to, learn to grow as a Christian. Mature. Witness. Learn to witness. Simple obedience in basic principle things will bring the blessings in your life. Now look at verse 8. I mean verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Notice this, God refers and gives him his confirmation of his presence. Have not I commanded thee to what? To be strong. And of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is what? With thee, whithersoever thou goest. Listen, we have God's presence in our life. I know things can look bad, and I don't know what the future holds in November, and things look pretty bad. For those of you who are paying any attention to what's going on in the world, things are looking pretty rough out there. Mm -hmm. But we don't have anything to worry about. Why? Because we've got the presence of God. Hallelujah. We've got God's presence. Hallelujah. We've got His power. We've got His person. We've got His presence here with us and in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, the day you got saved, God's Holy Spirit took residence inside of you. And the Bible says that you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit of God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Jesus Christ talked about you and I being one with him. Listen, guys, we have God's presence. We have God's power. We have God's promises. And we have God's purpose in our life. Hallelujah. We've got nothing to worry about. No matter what the future holds. You know, you see Christians that are fearful and stressful and worried. They're afraid of this. They're afraid of that. They're afraid of the virus. They're afraid of, they're afraid of everything. God hasn't given us the what, people? The spirit of fear, but of what? The power of love and of a sound mind. What are you afraid of? Nothing. If you, you literally see Christians that are walking around in a panic. In a panic. Guys. I don't mean any disrespect to anyone, but listen, if God wants you to have the virus, he's going to give it to you. Amen. Do you understand that? And you can take all the precautions in the world, and it's, going to, it's not going to mean anything. And if God wants to use the virus to take you home, so be it. And yet we still see Christians that are fearful, living in doubt and apprehension. God told Joshua, have I not commanded thee to what? Be strong. Joshua is facing battle after battle in his life. You think he just went into a shutdown? Or quarantine? <laughs> well, we can't do this. I mean, man, we got some fish issues out there. No, no, no. God told him, get up and do what I called you to do. Move forward. Move forward. You ever think about the early church and the boldness that they had? Guys, come on. They were being put to death. <laughs> For serving Jesus Christ. How many guys have ever read Fox's Book of Mild? Does anyone read that? How many guys have ever read Jesus Freaks? It's a quick read. It's an awesome book. The, number, the first volume was awesome. That, they, they were being killed. The percentages of, of them for serving Jesus Christ to be put to death was 100%. They would kill you. Horrible ways. 
Did they stop meeting in fellowship? No. It says they met daily and they ceased not to teach and preach and preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. They met daily. Even with the chances of being put to death was a hundred percent. Not only that, but they took the disciples and killed them. And you know what the other ones did? They kept doing what God called them to do. They just kept being obedient to God. You mean to tell me, listen, they're burning Bibles now. They're shutting down churches in California. They ain't going to shut us down. No. And by all means, they ain't going to burn this Bible. No. no. Let's bow our heads forward to prayer. Lord, we come before you and thank you and praise you for who you are. We thank you for the book of Joshua. And thank you for the people here. And Lord, I pray that you would lead them into victory. And Lord, we, we do know what the future holds. We just don't know when. We just don't know when everything's going to begin to unfold. We know it will. But we pray that your people will be sustained by your power and your presence, Lord, in their life as a Christian. That you would help us to be strong and of, of good courage. Lord, that you would give us the fortitude and the strength that we need to face what's coming up in November. Lord, we are in a bad, we're in a war right now, this country. It, it, it's a little bit physical, but by all means, it's a spiritual battle. It's a political battle. This could be the very turning, this is the very turning point of our country, not could be, but it very well is. That will determine how the scriptures will un begin to unfold whether we have more time or whether we have less time. And Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for giving us the special revelation according to your word, Lord. We love you and praise you in Christ's name.